So uh, I work for Ivor Club Eviden, and uh, so they're supporting tonight's uh, lecture for us all here. And uh, we're going to really focus on fixed dental prosthetics. Now, this could be chair side or for the laboratory. Um, so produced with digital uh, manufacturing. So just a couple of Okay, so I'm just muting a couple there because I can hear a lot of feedback. Is that all good for everybody? Okay, so just a couple of learning objectives. So I want you to really gain some uh, useful information yeah. on the different types of ceramics. Just checking out, you can still hear me. Um, understand more. Okay. <laughs> understand more about the uh, yeah. indications and contraindications for the all ceramic materials, uh, about the preparation guidelines and minimum thicknesses, and uh, hopefully some good information on how to select the most suitable translucency and guide your way through the maze of the, the, the translucency when you're dealing with non-ideal underlying colors. Uh, then we're going to talk about the characterization of the materials, and uh, they've got some nice little videos of how we uh, build in the aesthetics. And then we're going to talk about post-treatment for uh, cementation protocols. So, so there's the agenda again um, on that. So just a little bit about myself. So uh, I feel like I've been in um, dentistry forever. I started back in 1992 uh, working as a technician in a dental lab in Haven, Hampshire. Uh, most of our work there was uh, private, uh, pressable, or ceramics, and we did a lot of um, Nobel Procera back in the day. Um, so after about 10 years, I went into sales with uh, Voco, who, who many of you may know, do a lot of restorative and adhesive uh, materials. And then really sort of went back to my technical roots with Ivoclav Evidem uh, into technical sales and uh, being a bit of a product specialist there for Ivoclar, um, dealing with the laboratories, key accounts, and uh, advising them on all ceramics and uh, all of their materials. You can see I've been with Ivoclar Vivident now for about 15 years, and through my various guises, I've been fortunate enough to work uh, mostly around the digital and the CAD CAM portfolio, which is very exciting, very fast paced. Currently, uh, I work with the professional services team. So this is the uh, the arm of the business that I liaise with the universities, um, people like Linda that train other dentists, peer-to-peer -peer education, uh, and develop that side of the business for Ivor Club Evident. So it's pretty diverse and dynamic. I share a lot of what we do on Instagram. So. Uh, feel free to follow me at leo.james underscore dentistry and say hi and if you, if you like what we do, uh, it's always good to hear from you guys. So um, again now a little bit about Ivoclav Evident. Um, I don't know if any of you have been fortunate enough to uh, attend our training centre over in Ivoclav Evident in Liechtenstein. Um, we've got on the top floor of this green building here, you can see in the picture um, about uh, 200 um, R&D experts there developing products that will be re uh, released for the next 10 years. Um, there's about 29 offices throughout the globe with about 3,500 employees. Um, the company's motto is passion, vision, and innovation. So the passion that drives us within dentistry uh, the vision we have within that for, for the innovative products that the, the company are producing for you to use in practice and in the laboratory. So I'm going to get straight into talking about um, the dental ceramics and the physical properties of those materials for you. So looking at uh, dental ceramics, we can put them into four main categories. We've got our conventional uh, amorphous glassy ceramics, We've got some glass dominated ceramics and our crystalline dominated and crystalline ceramics. And when we're looking at our classification of these materials, we're looking at certain properties when we're looking at our indications. So when we start with our first group, we look at our um, felspatic and glassy materials. So 
These are considered the weakest ceramics that we have with a, a high lucite phase, sorry, a low lucite phase and a high silica phase. So you're looking at around up to about 30% of lucite. And lucite's added within our materials at Ivor Club Evident to increase the aesthetics, increase the strength, prevent crack propagation. These are normally going to be uh, layering materials in things like the VM materials and Ivor Club Evident Classic V. So with these type of materials, we're looking at a foil technique, thin veneer laminate uh, or porcelain fused metal. And so within that, the dental technician has a huge array of uh, ceramics and colors and materials that they can use to build over the alloy frame. And uh, just to give you a taste of that, we've got from the left to right here, we start off with our opaquing layer to disguise the uh, dark alloy that we have underneath. Then there's the option to do some uh, aesthetic characterization of that with some marginal materials. And then we move through to putting a little bit of enamel and some internal characteristics on there through to some uh, opalescent on the incisal edges and then whatever you see that the patient may have and trying to replicate that in the enamel. Now, one of the issues we have with um, porcelain infused metal is with this layering technique, we, we don't always get the ideal space. So here we've got two diagrams showing us um, two different ways of building up for the lab technician. On the left hand side with the ideal space, we have a, a thicker layer of dentine and a, a to enamel ratio. But when we have limited space, we have to try and create the illusion of uh, depth of color. And so there within this material, you can see the red outline. You've got the deep dentine material here. And the deep dentine is like a conventional opacious dentine that's gonna give the lab technician uh, more of a chance to build in the depth of color into your ceramic restoration. Now, when we're looking at uh, phosphatic layering, uh, if we're looking over the uh, zirconia with Emac Ceram, or if we're looking at style over a metal uh, alloy, op, uh, alloy material, we're looking at around 0.5 millimeter thick of uh, a core material there. And with the metal bonded material, we're really looking to bond and fuse the opaque layer to that material to give us a chemical bond and also some compressive bonding as well and take into consideration the coefficient of thermal expansion which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Then we're looking at our dentine layer and our deep dentine and our enamel layers so approximate thickness overall is around two millimeters but what we have here in a, a layering technique is we have a risk. We have a risk of our materials if they're under supported um, maybe not um, adhering to the material and through compressive uh, stresses in the in, or an environment we can end up with some chipping and I'm sure you can see here on the incisal edge of this old PFM restoration we've got uh, a chipped incisal edge there we've also got some recession at the gingiva and so generally these crowns look to get replaced with uh, newer uh, or ceramic or IPS style crowns. So when we look at the uh, glass dominated ceramics, we're getting into our pressable ceramics here. So, I mean, when I started back in the lab in the 90s, all those years ago, uh, we had uh, Empress Aesthetic, which was uh, a lucite um, based pressable ceramic, which we used for the wax loss technique. Now we're getting a little bit higher in our strength with up to 230 megapascals of flexor strength. And here we're able to make substructures purely in ceramic um, and do very nice um, dentine bonded type restorations that need to be adhesively bonded to the tooth structure. And some product names you probably remember the Vita, Vita Mark II blocks if you use Ceric. And from an Ivor Club Evident perspective, we have the Empress, and now we have the Emax Ceram, which falls within this uh, category. Moving forward, when we got out of the 90s into the noughties, the technology moved forward, and uh, Ivor Club Evident and many other companies have started to fuse more glass phases uh, to increase the volume of lithium disilicate crystal within the silica matrix to increase the strength up to a maximum of around 550 flexor, uh, MPA flexor strength. So Emax and um, 
its predecessor, Empress II, really revolutionized this type of material. And finally, there was something very, very strong, had multiple use, had um, different ways of producing and manufacturing the restorations and really gave us versatility through our all ceramic restorations. So our indications increase in this. So we go from single units now into our first foray of uh, being able to produce anterior three unit bridges. Um, and also now custom hybrid abutment crowns with the CAD-CAM technology. And then, you know, we're still in the early days with uh, doped zirconium oxide. Uh, Ivor Club Evident are producing more and more different varieties of this material, changing the percentage of the doped uh, zirconium oxide to change the physical properties. So we have our classic uh, three YZ uh, TP, uh, through to the fifth generation. And these different generations have different strength, different translucencies, and different indications. And I would always say if you're prescribing uh, zirconium oxide restorations to really speak to your lab about what your needs are for your cases. And then they, they should be able to advise you on the type of zirconium oxide that you would be looking at for your cases. Something with uh, a high translucency, for example, has a limited use on uh, indications for bridge work. You know, we wouldn't recommend um, a high translucent material for bridges over four units with uh, two pontics. So we'd be looking at using a, a, a lower percentage of the doped zirconia and making sure that we can get the, the higher strength. With that comes a lower translucency, so therefore the laboratory needs to do more work to build in the aesthetics by putting in um, layering options onto the zirconium oxide. Leo, can I ask you a question about the doped alumina yep. and zirconia? Um, what is the difference and what's the, what's the benefit of it? The doped uh, zirconia is, is the percentage of yttrium they place within the material to stabilize it. And when they stabilize the material with the uh, yttria at different percentages, it, uh, it changes the molecular structure, the grain size. Um, and what that does is they, they bind together um, in different ways. So some of them are more light reflective, like the high translucency, but then because of the grain size, uh, they're weaker. Um, and then the lower, um, the lower uh, doped yttrium zirconia, zirconia um, has a higher strength, but is at more risk of low temperature uh, degradation. Um, we have lots of studies on this type of um, attribute for this type of material. And uh, there's a link later on in the presentation or I'll send it out afterwards where you can get all of the studies compiled into one document, which is, which is quite useful. But I, I think um, zirconia for me is still a bit of a minefield. I mean, I understand the different generations, the benefits and features of those generations and what they can do. And I think this message needs to get out to the wider audience so people can fully understand um, how to get the best aesthetics, but also maintaining the integrity of the material. Mm. Thank okay. you. So um, just very, very brief overview there, because I really want to get into the, um, the production side of the material. What, what are the desirable properties for our materials? So, as I said earlier, the uh, felspatic materials, we're really looking at a condensation uh, stacked uh, layering. So these are very high aesthetic, um, fired to a refractory or um, uh, foil technique, but they're obviously very, very weak. So you need to be very, very careful when you're uh, fitting and adhesively looting these to the patient. The glass dominated give us a little bit more of a leeway. So uh, when we're looking at wax loss techniques, this is where as a technician, we would make all of our morphology on a model using um, uh, an ash free wax. We would sprue and invest these restorations and uh, burn the mold out into a burnout furnace. This would then be transferred across into a um, pressing furnace with the ingots you can see on the screen. And we would press those in around 20 minutes into our press material. Then we'd have to do a lot of divesting, sandblasting. Uh, we'd have to refine that with um, an Invex liquid, which was a hydrofluoric acid, to uh, remove the reaction layer between the investment and the lithium disilicate. 
and then finally we would uh, fit these down and start our aesthetic work on those. So that's quite labor intensive for a technician, it's quite manual, the press technology. And so when we've got the same material, lithium disilicate now in a block format, which can be used in a reductive technique with uh, CAD CAM, you know, chair side dentistry with the blue block, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, really has revolutionized monolithic uh, restorations because not only have we got a very easily machined material we've also got a very high aesthetic and high strength material so it really did revolutionize and evolutionize the uh, whole cat cam process and you now you know as uh, clinicians and technicians were absolutely spoiled for choice with the amount of materials we've got available to us uh, chair side and I think uh, it could become a bit of a maze when we look at these materials. And so we need to really understand what we need to gain from these materials in order to make use of them fully to get the results that we need. So our crystalline dominated materials are coming into now the uh, ZLS materials, which are things like um, the Suprenity from um, Vita and the Seltra from Dense Supply Serona. And again, these are mostly uh, uh, milled restorations, although they have again the ingots um, for CAD CAM. So, when we look at our fully crystalline structures with zirconium oxide, these can only be milled. There's no pressable uh, versions of these because of the microstructure of the material. In its green stage, before we sinter it, it's very powdery, very porous, and very brittle. So, we need to send it through this uh, sintering process, which can be anything from um, one hour to nine hours, depending on the indication you've milled, to make sure that we sinter effectively so that we don't have any uh, deficiency in our sintering to, to, to fully realize the optical properties and physical properties required uh, in the material. So our desirable properties are a high flexor strength. Um, so this is obviously the bending before um, of the material before it yields under pressure. So uh, one megapascal of flexor strength uh, would normally mean you can hang one kilo weight from a material before it would break. And then we want a high fracture uh, toughness. Um, you know, we want this so it uh, uh, avoids uh, a good resistance against chipping intraorally, uh, particularly monolithic restorations. And now we're getting very, very demanding patients, um, I'm one myself, um, with our optical properties. We want our restorations to look the best they can do. Patients are coming in with very high expectations. So you need to know about your translucency of your core material, how to achieve those shades, what information you need to give to the technician, or if you're doing it in-house with your uh, own CAD CAM system, you know, work your starting block. And this is what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. And then biocompatibility. More and more patients, I'm aware of this, are coming to, they come di directly to us at Iver Club Evident talking about uh, allergies to all sorts of materials. Now, most of our materials in the Emax range are more or less inert. There are some, uh, some good studies out there on the cytotoxicity of uh, lithium disilicate and zirconium oxide. Um, and these are, comparing against resins so if you want any more information on that that material we've got that but I mean the, 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 the sort of brief abstract from that study was that resins are generally 50 times more cytotoxic than ceramics so when we look at our ceramic material and the biocompatibility issues that some patients face we should maybe look closely at the cleanup of the cements around the restorations to make sure that we're doing the best job we can to avoid any inflammation around the tissue where the, the, the crown meets that. Then in our stacking technique, we really need to make sure that the coefficient of thermal expansion is compatible with our core material. This can cause catastrophic failure uh, for our restorations intraorally if this isn't correct. When we're not going to get a compressive uh, bond to the core material if the CTE is wrong. We're also not going to get um, a fusion to the material, a chemical fusion. And so this is where um, from very early on some of the uh, mistakes we see from fabricating all ceramics with zirconium oxide cores 
we initially thought we didn't have to build in the support, we didn't have to put those design principles in, and we soon found out the hard way that this wasn't the case and we really needed to make uh, a focus on that. So you'll see now when we look at the design of uh, these old ceramic restorations, we really try and maximize the design with the high strength core material and uh, really put the sort of micro layering cut back of the powder onto the buckle or labial aspect and uh, so we can get our aesthetics that way without compromising the strength. So the Emac system, excuse me, when I first got this on my desk at Ivor Club Evident in 2005, um, we got this system and we were we were blown away. We 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 saw all the sum of the parts and we we wondered how we would convey this message to uh, dental technicians and to clinicians across the globe. And what we really really needed to do was we nearly we needed to break it down into the sum of parts. So the IPS Emax you need to think about as an umbrella over a selection of core materials coordinated um, that can make various indications, in fact, any indication in the, in the oral environment now. And then over this, you have one layering material and one staining and glazing material. Now, from experience, when we had to make all ceramic anterior and posterior restorations in the past, we were taking two different uh, core materials one for its strength in the posterior, one for maybe its aesthetics in the anterior region. And what we were finding is trying to marry up the different shades of different systems gave us a bit of a manufacturing headache. So imagine when we started to present this to the techni technicians that we have out there, and we say to them, we've got one selection of core materials that are all coordinated, and regardless of whether you're making a single unit, a phosphatic unit, a press unit, a CAD unit, a zirconia unit, the same layering material goes over the top. So absolutely takes all the headaches away from producing all ceramics for different indications within the uh, oral environment. So we're really like uh, pleased that we got this, this material here from Ivor Club Evident. We're able to say we can produce literally all indications from one system. And here you can see the zirconium arches in the background that are designed on um, uh, in a 98.5 mil disc. And you can see they've got a supportive tongue through the middle. Uh, these will be sintered on that tongue so that they don't buckle or distort through the sintering process. And then we've got the blue blocks in the, in the front of the picture. And then you've got the various uh, lithium disilicate and uh, fluorapatite veneers in the foreground. So you can really see the variety of uh, restorations that you can produce from this material. Why has it been so successful? I mean, we've got a, a, a great heritage in um, clinical studies with this material. We have a 98% customer satisfaction and a 96% survival rate. We often get asked why we don't indicate certain uh, restorations like cantilever bridges. And when we talk to the R&D department about these type of restorations, they can be done. You can chance it with your patient if you've got nothing to, to lose, no risk uh, or minimal risk of, uh, of um, the restoration not working out. But from our perspective, when we did the internalized tests on this material, it, if it failed below 90%, then it wasn't an indication that we would recommend for the material. So we had very high... Uh, expectations of how the material needs to behave and perform for the clinician and more ultimately for the patient. Uh, you know, some of our competitors in more recent years have had a 75% survival rate. Now, if you've got a quarter of all your restorations coming back to practice, I don't think you'd be very happy with us. So, um, as I said earlier, all of these studies can be found in this uh, really nice put together uh, scientific report collates all of these documents so if you want that um, I can send the link out after the after the uh, presentation so you can get that directly so how does this look in the mouth um, you can see here we have a range of indications for a full arch case here um, so going in the posterior this is where we're going to find most of our monolithic restorations in either zirconium oxide or lithium disilicate and when we start to move around to the anterior part of, the, of the, uh, the mouth, this is where we need to start to be a bit clever. So if the patient has maybe uh, 
had a risk of chipping in sizal edges in previous restorations. This is where we need to build the, the, the strength in with our core material and with our design process. But where we've got uh, a higher demand for aesthetics, this is where we start to put the uh, nanofluorapatite uh, ceramic on the labial aspect so we can increase the aesthetics but without compromising the strength. Um, and so what I did uh, with, with this system is I've, I've given you here a, an overview and I'll start to put in the, um, the four groups that we've discussed previously. So when we look at our um, felspatic and glassy effects within the Emac system, you can see this is our conventional powder where we have all of our uh, high aesthetic uh, translucencies and impulse effects and special insert effects that have all been designed by various technicians. This also comes in a fluorapatite glass ingot as well called Zerpress. Not mostly, uh, more commonly used in the UK, but very much used in Europe and in the US. Um, over here, people tend to use the lithium disilicate press, which you can see here around 470 MPA. And also one of our most popular products now is the Blue Block, the uh, IPS Emax CAD. Now for the uh, zirconium oxide, we've got our um, 98.5 mil uh, discs that you can see in the background and then for chair side use uh, zirconium chair side we have the uh, blocks there for the CEREC system. So when we look at our indications we've got everything color coded so press comes in this green hue, Zerpress in the orange, Zercad in the grey, Emacs CAD in the blue and Ceram in the yellow. Um, so we put that across the, the top of the screen and then we put our indications down on the side and you can see here the indications uh, marry up with the various core materials and we can really take uh, something from each part of the system and we can really understand where our uh, indication sits within that. And as we strive towards more minimally evasive techniques, um, the guys that have done a lot of the research um, in Liechtenstein have started to now thin down the recommended thicknesses that we have for the restoration um, so you can be more conservative with your prepping. I know this has been a complaint in the past where um, patients or, or clinicians want to be more conservative and conserve good uh, tooth structure and not take so much away. I'm actually one of the first few cases uh, I was edge to edge wearing um, my anterior teeth away and I was actually a case study for no prep uh, veneers and uh, jaw reprogramming through orthodontics to correct that. And eight years in, I've got monolithic uh, veneer case um, that has not seen any issues at all with uh, Emacs Press. So I was very pleased to be there working with James Russell and Rob Leinock. Um, great team, did a great job, very, very happy with that. And, uh, Maybe, maybe one of you has seen that uh, out there in, in some of your studies. I know James Russell still talks about that case. So um, what can influence our, um, our all ceramics? So all of these factors here on the screen can influence positively or negatively your outcome with your ceramics. So we start with our underlying tooth structure. If you don't have an ideal preparation, this can affect the shade of your restoration if there's a lack of understanding about the translucency concept. If you had that discolored core and you hadn't communicated to your laboratory that it was discolored, what do you think the laboratory are going to do? They're just going to take a regular low translucency or high translucent material and when they go to uh, manufacture that in the lab, they're going to make that on a plaster model. This then is going to come back to you in practice and what do you receive? You receive a restoration that you try in and this restoration loses its value. You can only alter that so much with uh, a cement because the cement, um, you know, you've got five, 10 microns of a film thickness there. So there's not really a, a great deal you can do other than send it back and get the, the laboratory to make a new restoration using a more opacious material. So when we're looking at um, this challenge, so this is this is what you probably see in in surgery you know you you you've got a case there with a patient you 
you don't really, you're not really sure which direction to go, what translucency the concepts are, whether you should have a, a HT, MT, LT, MO or HO, and then the shade to that as well. So we try and from, from our perspective, give you some tools to help you overcome this issue. So you can see here on the on the on the high left hand side, we've got a, a vital um, a vital anterior prep there. But then on the other side, we've got some metal post and cores. We've got a composite post and core there, and the, the range of color underneath on that case is going to give you a headache. Then you've got uh, a, a ceramic post and core in the middle, so you've got a very small prep against a very large prep. And then on the veneers, you've got different thicknesses of the material. So these can all play uh, contributing factors into uh, not being able to achieve your aesthetics for your restoration. Let's just take a step back before we go into the communication to the lab. Let's look at what we, we do know. So we know about hue, value and chroma. We know that the hue or the color of the restoration is going to come from a shade tab for A1 to A4. The value within that, if we've got a, a bright restoration, we're going to be looking to more, more towards our lighter uh, um, one shades. And then the color saturation as it increases, we go down the scale to our 3.5 and A4s. But what about the underlying color? So I'm hoping a lot of you have seen the natural dye material. Uh, shade guide. So this is uh, an absolute crucial piece of information that you need to give to the laboratory um, to give them a good starting block to compensate for any discoloration that you've got uh, within your preparation. And it's always handy as you can see here to take a photograph with the three shades giving a selection of what could be the closest shade. Now the laboratory can take that and they can turn that into black and white and they can see the value within that shade tab and check that they've got the right underlying color to proceed with the job. Also, you Mia, need- can yeah. I ask you if you go back to slides? Yeah. Um, it shows some very dark, that, that one, yeah. Yeah. Those are the problems that we have with those, like those cores. Yeah. The three different colors, a metal core, mm. gray core, and all that. This yeah. is, these are the issues that we deal with. Yeah. And will you tell us which is the best um, ceramic to choose for that? To so I, that out? Yeah, I was just getting that on the next. I've got another slide to get to that. I, this to take that example through, Linda, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So this this is so if you can see here on the uh, on the screen, can you see my pointer on the screen? No. Yeah. No. Okay. So. On the natural dye material, the very dark black core material, if I go to the next slide, the very dark colors that we have on the screen, you need to select as, as the most darkest color. That, that's the color you need to give the lab. So you can see here on the top right, you've got a natural dye color of two, but next to it, you've got an ND3. And so this scale from ND1 to ND9, ND9 would be metal or very devitalized or even an implant restoration. Um, and if you give the lab the ND9, they, need, they know they need to use a very high opaque material to cover that, which does create them with a bit of a challenge in itself. But if you don't give them that uh, information of this natural dye shade guide, they will not have a hope in hell of achieving the aesthetics that you would want to achieve for your patient. So you can see here on the lower left picture, this is a tetracycline staining. So we've got uh, a whitish enamel zone, um, but we've got a very dark uh, cervical zone. And uh, you can see here on the canines, even darker with an ND4. So in this instance, we have materials uh, like a medium translucency, uh, which are all in very high, bright, vital looking shades. So the lab should look to uh, manufacture the uh, veneers in that instance in a slightly more opacified material, maybe even a low translucency. But it also will depend upon the thickness of the material. So if you imagine you've got um, a, a discolored core and a thin or ceramic material, 
there's only so much you can reduce that ceramic down before it starts to show through the metal discoloration. And so we have uh, quite comprehensive uh, preparation guidelines and uh, there's an app you can actually use as well to help you through this, which I'll give you the details of in a moment. But essentially, if you look at the, um, the thicknesses, the minimum thicknesses here, where we've highlighted with the, uh, the little circle on the line, these are the areas where if you get them too thin, they will shine through the underlying core material. And so we can measure these traditionally with a, a, a gauge to make sure that we've got the right min, uh, minimum thicknesses. But also digitally, we can do a 2D cut across the restoration and we can measure uh, these digitally as well. So we can check that we're on the right path with our restorations uh, through our digital design process on something like three shape. Now what the laboratory will do is they will take that natural dye color that you've given them and they will make and replicate the intraoral uh, prep color with a composite material based on the natural dye shade guide. And what this will give the lab technician is the true transition from the, the prep to the uh, restoration and then they can plan accordingly their colors. So. Not all labs will do this. Um, they will understand the concept, um, but there are a lot of labs that will manufacture using a natural dye to replicate the intraora situation. This is really something you can also do chair side as well if you're doing anterior cases and you have a CEREC system or another milling system um, to get that transition uh, from the prep to the crown. I know a lot of clinicians will just simply place the restoration onto the prep. If you do that, you need to use a glyceride gel to transmit the color through the restoration. Otherwise, if the restoration is dry, you won't get that transition from the underlying color through to the restoration. Um, the optical properties in the ceramic need that transition of a, a glyceride to do that. So something you can use, um, So essentially what the Shade Navigation app does is it takes you through five step process to, uh, to take you to the right translucency level and shade for your restoration. So you take into account the underlying color, the desired color, the indication type, the thickness of the material, and then the material you wish to use. Now at the moment, it covers the IPS Max CAD and press, and they've just introduced the zirconium oxide as well. Now this is a free app and um, in the menu on the help uh, center within the app, there's a lot of information about uh, how to uh, manipulate the underlying color and to achieve the aesthetics that you're looking for. It's not going to give you 100% conclusion in all cases. There's a little bit of um, subjectiveness with this, but I think if you're doing these shades chair side for yourself, it will absolutely give you a ballpark figure to work towards and you can customize this as well yourself so that you can incorporate your own preferences into the app as well. Um, we've used it many, many times now and, uh, you know, we're always surprised that, you know, it does give us a very good sound uh, base to work from to make sure that we're getting our, our, our restorations to the right track. So it's definitely something maybe just try out. Uh, you'd be, you'd be uh, hopefully pleasantly surprised at the results that you get from this.
like I say, it's a free resource. I'm all, I'm all for free resources as well. So let's just focus a little bit more on the IPS Emacs CAD. So this was the original uh, blue block from Ivoclav Evident or Lilac as it, 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 it more looks like. So you can see here on the screen with the SEM, uh, SEM graph photo there, all the little lithium disilicate crystals. So these crystalline structures are grown within the blue block at Ivoclav Evident and uh, it's one of those materials that it's kind of an unfinished product. So the, all of the optical properties are within the block in its blue stage. You are sold the, the block in this stage so you can mill it efficiently. So essentially in its blue stage, it's 110 megapascals of flexor strength, which means that the grinding burrs of the milling unit can mill this material really, really efficiently. If we uh, sold it in its fully crystalline state, you'd probably go through a lot of burrs and uh, a lot of time waiting for this to be milled. So it wouldn't be efficient for you. It's from our lithium disilicate portfolio, um, which most of you probably realize is the IPS Emacs press. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side, we've got the multi-layered ingot, which is a, a patented ingot for Ivoclub Evident, where you can press multi-layered restorations. So it's the only one on the market that does that. And, and we train technicians on how to uh, do this and how to then characterize that externally. Let's look at the blue block production. So do you remember earlier we talked about the different phases of the material? So what the R&D department have done in the Emacs CAD material is they've manipulated and uh, kind of proven the material with different temperatures to grow the crystals at different stages. So you can see when we start off, the block is clear when it's manufactured and the glass phase is very, very low. So here it's similar to our phosphatic material, very low strength, um, very low crystal matrix in there and uh, you know not very strong, but got to be very high in aesthetics. So what they do is they um, grow these crystals through a thermal treatment. And so this thing takes it to its blue color or its lilac color. So in this phase, you've got a good marginal stability from the milling because nobody wants all their margins to chip while they're milling these restorations, but it gives you efficient machining. And then what you need chair side is a, a programmat uh, ceramic furnace with a two stage cycle in there. Now this can take about 14 minutes to 25 minutes to process. Um, but once it comes out, you've got the high strength uh, Emacs CAD material where the crystalline phase is fully matured at 70%. And so this is where now it says 530 megapascals of flexor strength. So it's fully optimized to withstand all of the uh, forces that you'll have within the oral cavity. So indication wise, uh, we see a, a, a real growth of um, individualized, customized abutments for patients with tie bases with this material. Monolithic anterior, uh, including the three unit bridges. Maybe not so much was the veneering solutions with uh, lithium disilica over zirconium oxide. Personally, I found this uh, a very tough material to process. You needed a lot of reduction of the prep, which isn't ideal. And also the fusion process is, uh, is quite laborious. So now we have all these uh, nice high aesthetic uh, zirconium oxides that look like lithium disilica. We, we don't really need to do this veneering process. So indication wise, again, we've got the widest range of indications for this type of material from our tabletop thin occlusal veneers. The minimally evasive uh, aspect kicks in again our button solutions, and then our veneering solutions. So now let's look at the translucency concept. So all of our translucency content is color coded. So if we start at the bottom, we've got the impulse colors. So these are opalescent enamel replacement blocks that come in two opalescent uh, shades. One is very, very translucent. You need full height of your preparation underneath this. You wouldn't want any incisal reduction because you'd get a demarcation where the to structure meets the ceramic. Next, we have our medium opacity. So these are gonna be a core material. These are gonna be very good for shading and uh, disguising discolored preparations. 
They don't come in A to D shades, they come in uh, MO0 to MO4. MO0 being a very whitish bleach looking shade. MO1 and 2 being one of the most popular colors, so your A and B shades. I tend not to use the three and the four because they lose their value and they're very hard to control when you're manufacturing substructures. Now probably our widest uh, and uh, most forgiving translucency is the low translucency. So this is ideal for your full uh, anatomic restorations for your posteriors. Uh, veneers, if you need a little bit more color stability, the low translucency has got a high chroma with a low uh, translucency aspect to it. So it's gonna be very, very color stable, very forgiving in, in situations if you've got posterior inlay onlays with some old amalgam underneath. Um, now, if it gets too thin, they will transmit that, but you know, you, you'd be more uh, fortunate with this than you would if you went to the high translucency. So before we get to that, the medium translucency, these have been developed for uh, very aesthetically driven patients. So you can see there, they're only available in the lighter, whiter, bright shades. This has been extended out to include now the BL1 in more recent months. Um, but these are gonna be your veneer cases, um, cases where patients are coming in really conscious and probably doing some whitening. Um, they're very, very bright, these, these uh, restorations. And then finally, the high translucent material. So this is gonna be um, for your restorations that you need to have a chameleon effect and uh, disappear to within this two structure. So occlusal onlays or inlays, uh, partial restorations, crowns and veneers. You need a good underlying color. So if you look on your natural dye shade guide and you get anything beyond an ND4, I would not be looking at a high translucent material because also the thicker this material is, it grays out because there isn't the chroma within the material to uh, hold the color. So you really need to make sure that a vital restoration, not too thick, and make sure that you, um, you don't have that devitalized underlying color. Like I said, you can use the Shade Navigation app, or kind of what I've done is I've aligned this to the type of material you would find on the two structure for this material. So if you think of your HT and MT as an enamel replacement and uh, very translucent, you, you'll, be, you'll be okay in putting that into places where you've still got some uh, enamel on the tooth, you're not going into dentine, you've not got the discoloration. When we get down to the salmon red uh, situation, then we're looking at these being more like a dentine color. So they have a higher saturation of chroma and uh, you know, you, you've got a little bit more play there in uh, using these in those in, uh, instances. This in conjunction with the processing techniques. So we're spoiled for choice. We've got the option to do fully monolithic restorations with our LT, our HT and our MT. Then we can start doing micro reduction of this or uh, a staining technique with some ceramic on the labial or buckle aspect. If we need to do a full coverage restoration, we can use the Emacs Ceram over the entirety of the restoration. Um, and we do a wash firing to get the chemical um, fusion onto there prior to layering over with our dentine and enamels. And then if we're looking at these restorations in the posterior region, we can keep them monolithic and stain and glaze with uh, either color. So we also need to have a wide range of block sizes for efficient machining. Now, I do understand that inventory on these blocks can be expensive and most clinicians and technicians will just keep a C14. But if you're looking at milling lots of small inlay onlay restorations, the I-12 will save you a lot of hours uh, of machining. So making sure that you've got the most efficient block size will save you a lot of time uh, in the long run. So looking at the I-12 and the C-14 for the majority of the work, the C-16 has been brought forward uh, if you're doing uh, incisal um, restorations where you need a lot more height. And then the B-32 is for your bridge blocks uh, for three unit anterior bridges we wouldn't tend to recommend having the uh, canine as um, a terminal uh, pontic. 
The B40 and B40R are solely for laboratory use, and then the abutment blocks have the pre-drilled holes within them with an anti-rotational grip, and these are used in conjunction with a titanium base. And I've got a clinical case of that later on to show you. So let's look at the characterization. So we've gone through some of our underlying issues and how we can correct those using a natural dye shade guide. We've looked at what our desired color is and how to take into consideration um, the translucency concept, making sure that we've got something that's more opacified over something that may be non-vital. And now we need to look at all of the, the, the tricks that we can use to build in surface texture into our restorations. So we can wax and design all of these restorations beautifully uh, in the laboratory, or we can design them beautifully with a CAD CAM on a chair side unit. But if we leave them like that, we're not going to build in the primary and secondary and tertiary uh, detail that makes uh, a natural tooth look natural. So we use uh, NTI, uh, NTI burrs here and generally I would draw a little map on a tooth like this and I would use various diamonds and polishers and rubbers to build in different textures into the tooth uh, to give it that natural um, aesthetic that we have and you can really build in the level of detail here using we use a protocol so i would normally use uh, some diamonds and some cutting tools first to draw my uh, lines in and then i would be smoothing those out with polishers to make sure they weren't so aggressive obviously this does depend on the uh, surface texture of your patient but if you've got a fairly young patient with lots of detailing, then you can really go to town on building those in. And this is something we spend a, a good few days on when we do our training process uh, with the technicians to optimize and maximize this. It, it is an art form. It's very easy to cut these lines in and have them looking like uh, horrific grooves in the tooth that are, are not very desirable. And once you do that, it, it is kind of game over. But there's a lot of a lot of work out there, and I know this is something of uh, real interest to CERIC clinicians. So color now. So when we take our our blue block, we have to visualize how this block is going to become the the shade that we want it to be. So what you've got to remember that the blue block contains all of the components to be a specific shade. So once we take it through the firing process, it's going to be a very flat, very straightforward BL to D4 shade. So if it says LTA2 on the block, on the packet, uh, when you mill that and crystallize it, if you just want to polish it, crystallize it and fit it, it will be a very straightforward plain A2 color. Now this could be ideal for an upper seven or upper eight where your aesthetics are non-vital or, or not as important, but you just want to get a, a good coverage crown there. But if you're wanting to put more uh, detail into this, then you can use these surface stains. So we've got the Emacs CAD crystal shades from zero to four. And these are in the chroma group for those restorations. We have a couple of incisal colors, a bluish color and a purple color. So these are dependent on the different uh, a to D shade that you would want. So the bluish color more for the BL shades and the A shades. Then we have uh, a selection of stains across the bottom. So the white through to the mahogany. So the lighter colors normally highlighting uh, cusp tips and incisal edges. And then the darker colors, maybe a little bit of attrition or wear or uh, some fissure staining with mahogany, which I know not many patients will uh, tolerate. But as a technician, we would still like to put this in. So efficiency in processing. So we start with uh, a basic polishing technique, and this is called a self-glaze technique with Emacs CAD. So essentially, we're going to try the restoration in, we're going to polish it extra orally, we're going to put it into the furnace, we're going to crystallize it on a 14 minute cycle, and then we're going to take it out, try it in, and go through to our bonding procedure. This is our very lowest aesthetic restoration, but it's our most efficient. Then we look into the variant A, B, and C. So variant A is using a speed technique, which is a spray glaze on a, a maximum of two units. So this is using the same 15-minute uh, cycle, 
um, but we're going to get a higher gloss with a spray glaze. This is a nano glaze uh, developed exclusively for chair side use. Now, one of my preference for doing the blue block is variant B, where we take um, the glaze paste, we apply this to the external surface of the restoration. We then apply some stains and chroma and color through the glaze and we fix that in one cycle. It does take a little bit longer, around 25 minutes, uh, but the optical effects of this are, I just think they're lovely. They come out very, very well. This material's got some clarity to it that's um, very, very um, easy to achieve. And then we can go through to adding stains and glazes with the spray technique as well. So this is what you would do chair side. Looking at the lab side, we're building in a higher level of aesthetics. So what the lab technician will tend to do with Emacs CAD is they will crystallize the blue block first. Then they would make a natural dye material uh, to replicate the intro or situation as we discussed earlier. Then we would start to put some external stains on. Now we may use these blue colors that we've already discussed with the blue syringes, but moreover, we have another uh, material called Ivor color, which is a huge palette of color that would be applied. And then we would do a separate glaze. So there's a couple of firings there, which takes the time up to around 30 minutes. When we start looking at cutbacks, our firing time increases to an hour in total, because we're probably gonna fire this around three or four times. So we would um, put an initial firing on with a wash firing. We would do an, inside, um, uh, an internalized staining firing. Then we would put um, an incisal firing on and then maybe an addition and glaze firing after that. So you can see the, the processes start to get a little bit longer. This intensifies even more with even more firings when we look at a fully uh, anatomical buildup in powder and liquid with the ceram over a core material. So you can see there we're up to about an hour and a half with our firing cycles, depending on the indication. So I've got a short video here. Um, I can just play, there we go. So this is just gonna guide you through the process that we've got for uh, treating a, a, a blue block. So initially we need to take away the uh, attachment that would have been to the block. And we use, um, I use a diagen stone for this because a diagen stone doesn't produce much heat and uh, it trims the material very, very well. We need to then obviously check our contact points with an indicating paper to make sure that they're not too hard or too firm. We use a similar stone to adjust those. Next, we need to check our occlusal contacts, make sure that we're not hard on the bite. We've got no interference with the occlusal load here. And we recommend to do all of this in the blue stage because this in the blue stage is easier for you to trim and manipulate and alter. If you do this once it's crystallized, it's, it's a lot tougher material. So we're gonna crystallize and characterize this. So we need to clean out uh, any grinding material from the occlusal area. When we're going to crystallize, we need to support the restoration on an auxiliary firing paste. So this is object fixed putty that we're putting into the restoration here. And what this does is it supports um, the restoration through the firing process on a supportive pin. So we take the most appropriate sized pin and push it into the putty. Then we're gonna take a silicon or modeling tool and we're gonna make sure our margins are supported and the pin is attached securely. If you've got anything on the external uh, aspect of the restoration, take a clean brush, maybe moistened with some water, and just remove any of the excess object fixed putty. Then we're gonna extrude our crystallized shades, shade one to four, based on the block that we're gonna use. So for example, an A2 block would have a shade one. So we're gonna paint that on around the cervical, put some enamel color on with maybe the bluish color and the whites and now here we're going to spray at 10 centimeter distance while turning the block um, also restoration we're going to be spray glazing this to fix those uh, colors into position so we do this a couple of times until we've got a whitish color evenly distributed over the restoration you can see here it's got no purple showing through and you can see the, the, the colors through that as well. This then goes into the program at, uh, this is a, a lab furnace, a 510, but we have a CS furnace. So we have a speed crystallization already programmed in, so it's nice and intuitive. 
This is a two-stage firing that we use, and it's about 25 minutes. And when the restoration comes out, you can see here on the pin, it's fully supported. And we take it out of the furnace, we put it onto the cooling tray, and we need to close the furnace head to remove any heat source. And we need to be patient and give it a couple of minutes to cool down. When it's at room temperature, then we can clean the object fix from the fit surface of the restoration. We can try it on our model and you can see here, we've got a beautifully glazed stained restoration uh, in Emacs CAD. So um, that was the overview and I've got a couple of clinical cases here to show you here uh, based upon some of the discussion that I've given you today. Uh, this is a case by Andreas Kerbad from Germany, and this is an all too familiar site of a failing PFM on a, a posterior molar. Uh, we can see here the, uh, op, uh, the opaque layer has gone completely from this restoration, so we've, we've got a, a definite fracture here. So that we remove the restoration and tidy up the prep. This was all done in one firing with um, the Emacs CAD. This is using the glaze paste and the uh, crystal shades and stains. Now optionally, once this was uh, crystallized, you have got some add-on powders you can use to give some more definition to the cusp tips if you wish. And so here, this is a, a powder liquid format that's added on after the crystallization process. And then this is put back through the furnace for an addition firing. So that takes about 10 minutes. So in total, there's probably about a uh, 45 minute firing of this restoration. So, um, Leo, uh, Benny's just put on the chat yeah. that sometimes he finds the glaze is slightly rough. Is that because there's too much glaze? So, if the glaze is too rough, it could be a couple of reasons. So, one of the reasons could be that um, uh, you've mixed the glaze, maybe and diluted a little bit of the staining glaze liquid. And therefore, when the glaze is a little bit too dilute, um, when it fires over the restoration in the furnace, the glaze is too sparse. And what you end up is you end up with the, uh, the glaze bubbling on the surface and spreading out too thinly and it and then looks pitted. Um, so one way to combat that is, is, is to really make sure that the glaze consistency is a creamy consistency and not too thin. The other thing could be that it's too thick. So you have to be in the middle here with this. Um, there are some really good videos on our YouTube channel that show you that a soft peak for this material is where you really need to be aiming and not applying it on too thick. Um, I know it's been a while since we've, we've been into the practice to see, but always happy to come down, revisit and go over these in a little bit more detail. I know when we came in, it was a bit rushed, but just observe maybe not diluting the glaze down too much and uh, a soft peak on this. So when you pull the tool away from the glaze, it should just lightly slump onto the palette um, and then it's, it's good to apply. And hopefully, you know, if you can um, get it a good happy medium, that would sort that issue out, okay? Hopefully we'll do a hands-on when we're allowed to um, yeah. be less socially distanced to do something like that in the practice with everybody. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, you're all, we, we, have a, we have also a great facility up in Leicester as well, where we have all the classrooms set out for, for this. And uh, we can We're do not going to Leicester for a while. No, I know. I know. Nobody wants to go Nobody. to Leicester for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you, want to go either. I understand totally, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's look at a case where we're bringing analog and digital together. So, um, what I really like at the moment is uh, these, these hybrid cases. So here we've got some um, carious and failing anterior restora um, uh, composite restorations that have been prepared. Now, this case was digitally produced with three shapes. You can see here the smile design with all of the beautiful uh, surface detail that we've replicated uh, digitally. So this was then printed on the right-hand side with a resin um, and tried onto the model physically so we could check the fit, we could check the occlusion, we could check the contacts, and make sure everything was in place. Then we went back to an analog process of uh, sprueing up these and putting them on the sprue former there, the blue former you can see to the, to the left. 
And this was pressed with uh, Emacs Press Multi. And you can see there the little windmills of the press uh, material. So this press is in from the contact area. So you can get that denting to enamel ratio just so. And the result is you can really dictate exactly where you want that enamel to denting ratio. So these are um, literally just very micro layering um, on the uh, labial aspect towards the incisal edge. But most of the color here is, is within the material layered through the ingot, uh, through the technology that they've done through the press technique. It's a really nice uh, material to work with. We're still um, sussing out how to get the uh, ratios dead right, but we are, we are more or less there. And then if we want something with a little bit more aesthetic in the interior, so we've got here a case of uh, a patient wearing the uh, incisal edges away on the teeth. And this is all too common where we've lost volume. And this was kind of what was happening to myself. Um, now here they've used uh, quite an aggressive prepping technique. Um, but you can see here the natural dye shade guide to obtain the underlying color because we're gonna do some very thin restorations on those lower teeth. We need to make sure we're gonna use the right translucency. So this case was actually pressed with um, Emacs Press. And you can see here the micro layering of the uh, anterior crowns here. Um, and the posteriors were mostly uh, monolithic restorations. So where the aesthetic demands are higher, we've built in more um, detail with the ceramic, but we've kept the support in here by not reducing the substructures down too far. And uh, I think they really, really look um, so beautiful, so natural. Um, you know, if you get that translucency right with the underlying color, also the cementation, sometimes not maybe always going for a transparent material, maybe using something with a little bit of warmth. So there's some yellow cements out there that really do add a little bit of warmth to the neck and give you a more natural transition from the tooth structure to the all ceramic. And then this case here, this is a case, again, you can see severely worn dentition. There's some, some very old metal bonded restorations in the posterior. In the palatal view, we can see here the wear on these teeth. So we would not really look to be doing anything with a cutback and layering of any ceramic in the posterior. So what was manufactured here were some fully anatomic uh, posterior restorations in Emacs CAD. So these were just crystallized and stained and glazed. But due to the aesthetic demands of the anterior, you can see here they did a, a very small uh, incisal edge cut back with some amylon effects. We did some internal staining on these with the ivory color and then some layering over the top with some opalescent materials. And so overall, we've got some very strong monolithic restorations in the posterior through to some more highly aesthetic, but still very strong uh, micro layered cut back anterior cases, uh, anterior restorations. And the final result is, uh, is, is really, really quite, quite nice. Again, the biocompatibility of this material, the lifelike aesthetics of the material really do come into play. And then one of my favorite, favorite cases that I like to see at the moment, um, that we're doing a, a more and more of, we see more and more people doing these are, hybrid abutment restorations with implants. So if you're restoring or sorry, if you're placing implants or if you're referring your patients uh, for implant placement, and then you're coming to restore these uh, chair side, you can do these if they've, if they've got the ideal situation of group function, uh, you can do these uh, very, very effectively in-house now with your CEREC or uh, three shape system where you see the little uh, gray scan flag that gives you the location and position of the uh, implant to your system so you scan that little scan flag uh, this then transfers the data of the position of the implant to the uh, digital system you can then design on top of that your abutment hybrid abutment crown you can see here this is the uh, pre-drilled a block abutment block and this is a a16L and the L is the access hole size. So we have an L and an S size. So these are small and large. And these are very much dependent on the platform and the width of your uh, abutment from your implant manufacturer. 
So these are then crystallized in the furnace and stained and glazed all in one. We then use a specific hybrid abutment cement that's got a, um, a very strong adhesion to inorganic matter, so ceramic and metal. We would use a monobond primer on the uh, alloy, uh, monobond plus for about 60 seconds uh, onto there. And we would etch the surface of the ceramic with a hydrofluoric solution of 5% for 20 seconds. The access hole is uh, filled with a gauze and then some composite using a dentine and a little bit of enamel. So you get a good blending in of that access hole there. And again, they blend in beautifully into the oral environment. So let's briefly talk about cementation. And I really like this slide when I look at um, our all ceramic materials and how we should be pre-treating these materials prior to cementation. So if you look at um, the materials on screen, we've got a mixture here of all ceramic materials from the IPSC Max CAD, which is your lithium disilica. We've got some Empress CAD, which is a lucite uh, glass ceramic. So lithium disilica is around the 500 MPA. The lucite is around 200 MPA flex storage strength. And then in the middle, we've got the high strength zirconium oxide. Now, when we're looking at our pretreatment indication, we are looking at um, an adhesive system or a self-adhesive system. And we need to treat our material uh, accordingly to our adhesive system that we're going to bond with. Generally, I mean, this is something we see very, very commonly is people using, um, or clinicians, sorry, using lots of different uh, hydrofluoric etchants on lithium disilica and lucite ceramics. We have seen percentages as high as uh, 10 or 15% used for around eight minutes on these materials, which is way too long. You uh, will damage the matrix that the glass lithium crystals are suspended in and weaken the material long term. So really, really do look at your percentage of your hydrofluoric acid and etch accordingly. Ivoclav Evident produce a red ceramic etch, uh, which is a 5% solution. And we only recommend that you etch for uh, 20 seconds. So you can imagine if you've got a 20 or 15% etching and you're etching for eight minutes, there's a lot of damage being done to that material. So once you've done your etching, so 60 seconds for lucite materials, 20 seconds for Emax CAD and for zirconium oxide, we need to do a light sandblasting with aluminium oxide around 20 to 70 micrometers and a low bar pressure. Similarly with our resin materials, we need to be uh, giving us the biggest surface area that we can for our adhesive system. So we're sandblasting or using glass beads on those as well. Then we've got our primers. So um, you can use something like monobond etch and prime, which is your etch and primer all in one. So you apply, you agitate for 20 seconds, you leave for 40 seconds, you rinse. This will etch and prime your material ready for bonding, giving you a very active surface re um, receptive to your um, looting composite. This can be the same for your Empress CAD. And then for your Zercad, we monobond and we use uh, an adhesive system or depending on the indication and a retentive preparation, we can use a self-adhesive system as well. Tetracad and Teleocad. Teleocad, we really want to be bonding in as a temporary measure. So we need to be using a temporary cement that's going to be easy for us to remove. And with the Tetracad, we're using um, Adhes Adhesive Universal Pen and the Verilink or Multilink material for an adhesive system there. There is a good little um, cementation guide on the website called the Cementation Navigation System. Again, this is a, another free resource. And what you can do is you can put in your, your indication, you can put in your prep, the type of substructure you've got, whether it's an implant or whether it's a tooth. You can take that through to the type of system you wanna bond with, whether it's an adhesive system or self-adhesive, and it will give you a menu and a workflow um, based upon your recommendations into that and hopefully guide you through that because I do understand that these processes can be a bit daunting uh, if you're not so familiar with these. It's, for me, it's a process. You, if you understand the steps within the process, then 
um, you should be able to navigate your way through. Similar for us when we're building restorations, chair side and uh, in the laboratory with our layering materials. We understand the materials, we understand the process, we understand the, the, the way we have to do that to make sure we don't uh, risk getting any shade errors for that. Um, so I think that is my presentation um, complete. Hopefully there was um, a lot of information there that was relevant to you. Um, feel free to unmute and ask. Excellent, questions. if everybody uh, can unmute. Um, we have Brian here, who's our technician at Tusk Dental. I'm sure Brian's got some comments to make, Brian. Hi there, sorry, just busy unmuting here, sorting things out. Hi, Brian. Um, Hi there, Leon. How are you? Um, yeah, no, it all looks very, very interesting, actually, um, especially the new Zercad developments. Um, I mean, we spent years working and playing with, with the Emac side of things and the lithium disilicate side of things, um, mastering all the different multi-layer and uh, multi-translucencies and uh, opacities and things like that. And it is, it's, it, it is an art form. Um, but you guys are putting together quite a nice little package now of, of, of all the different options and and a way of putting it together that, that it actually makes sense. Um, and I think yeah. it's going to be a lot easier going forward. And one of the new zirconias really does act like lithium disilicate, but has the yeah. strength of, of, of 1200 megapascals. So you can do the full arch cases, but get your, your aesthetics built in. So the new gradient yeah. technology, they've done a fantastic job with, yeah. And the, the yeah. stumps, the stump shades, how easy is it to get the shade guides? Yeah, well, Linda, you would have got one in your uh, starter kit for Emacs, if you remember. Um, but again, get in touch. I mean, sometimes you can get in touch with the lab. The lab will help you resource those from a lab supplier. Uh, companies like Henry Shine or Dental Directory will also sell those direct. They're not too expensive, and I think... Um, the amount of benefit you will receive from having something like that with you when you're doing your restorations is absolutely probably worth the money, you know, uh, if it's going to save you a headache in the long term. The shade, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I'm sure ben, Benny has got also some questions because he's been doing a lot of uh, digital stuff. Hey, hey Benny. Benny. He's still there. Uh, hi there, yeah, I'm still there. My main question was answered then. Um, about the uh, about the glazing, I've been having some kind of unreliable kind of uh, effects when when trying the spray glaze and the paint glaze. So uh, I think it's just a bit more practice to get it uh, more refined and and reliable. I think. Yeah, I mean it can be the the mixing, and it also can be the 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 application. So it's it's, it's easier for us to. Um, Kind of sit with you and, and look through this uh you know to, to spot exactly what it is but i would just say that not diluting not having it too thick and too gloopy on the surface um just just be a, a very smooth clean consistency sometimes you do need to do them twice there's no getting away from it as technicians we 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 tend to put them through a couple of times if we're not happy with it so i don't think it's it's reasonable to always expect it to be a one hit wonder yeah. It just doesn't work out that way. And then the worst case scenario, you, you know, you're going to have to get your polisher out, and polish it manually. <laughs> yeah. We've all done that as well. Yeah, you mentioned about just uh, just polishing and then crystallizing on the speed fire setting. Um, how much polishing are we talking in when it's in the purple phase? Because I uh -huh. think that could be kind of quite useful in terms of the inlays, like in areas that on like sevens, for example, where aesthetics aren't a massive concern. I, I would go to a high gloss polish with a, a good lithium disilicate uh, polishing medium. Um, yeah, polish it as high as high gloss as you can, you know, if that's the, the desired effect. The, the, it polishes very, very easily in the purple stage. Um, and then once you crystallize it, you can, you can um, pre-treat it, fit it, bond it, and then repolish once it's fitted to get that high luster. Okay. We tried. We tried one on um, in the purple stage, and the patient bit it and broke it. So, oh. we, had to, <laughs> so we had to start again. Um, so yeah. we don't tend to try them in anymore. Very, very light taps on uh, on the on the try-in with the uh, the occlusions. There, I can see you've got a question also on 
Cement. Chemlish. Chemlish, do you want to um to put your video screen on? Yes, just a quick question. What cements can be used for cementation of Emacs? I mean, as, as we've established, we've got a broad indication of uses for Emacs and um, two main core components, lithium disilica and uh, zirconium oxide. So if we look at the, the core components, I would always normally recommend that lithium disilica is adhesively bonded. So, I mean, we manufacture very link aesthetic for that or multi-link. Um, you've got things like Nexus and uh, Calibro and all of those materials out there. But as long as it's a, an adhesive bonding system, then that, that would be the best route for that. If you've got a retentive prep or a zirconium uh, oxide material, then you can go for something that isn't adhesive. So maybe a self-adhesive system like Speedsem or the Relay X Unichem, something like that. So you've got a, a, a broad range. I mean, it really depends on having a retentive or non-retentive prep and then the strength of the material. So if you're looking at Emacs CAD, for example, you know, that's considered a high strength at around 530 megapascals. If you've got a retentive prep, then you could do a self-adhesive, non-retentive, you need to do an adhesive system. So look at your, your strengths there of your material. I, I can send the, the, you know, the little chart I had before, I'm more than happy to send that because that gives you um, a clear indication of the material, the strength of the material, and then the uh, bonding protocol for that material. So I'm more than happy to email that to you, Linda. Yes, if you could, yeah, if you could email it to Diane. It looks like Diane's in a disco at the moment, <laughs> but she's having a good time there. Um, but yes, if you send it all to Diane, then she can email it to everybody who's attended with their certificates. I, I and promise Peter. you I'm not in a disco. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> no problem. And what about Alexandra? Do you have any questions? Uh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, so you're saying that for Emacs, Relax would not work? It depends on the indication. Relax, you've got, again, in, within the Relax brand, you've got adhesive and self-adhesive cements. So they will work, but you need to check um, what your substructure is of your Emacs crown. So. Uh, for example, if it's zirconium oxide, you can use the self-adhesive version of Rel-IX. But if you've got, you, then you've got the Unichem adhesive version for your lithium disilica. So you really need to look at what, if, uh, this is why I stick to adhesive and self-adhesive systems. Because mm. hopefully as a clinician, you know what your cementation type is. And then you can have that judgment call, clinical judgment call on the suitability of the cement for your indication. Okay, so you would say like a, a Variolink, uh, which is from you guys, or a Panavia would, would work then? An adhesive system like Variolink, Panavia, or um, Calibra, yeah. Um, again, particularly for non-retentive, uh, where you need that adhesive cementation. Because, you know, they've sold to us Relix that it goes basically with anything, right? Metal, uh, Emacs, but uh, that's interesting. Mm. I mean, I know, like I say, there's, there's within the ReliX brand, there are different yeah. types yes, of know, yeah. material. Yeah. So, you know, you have to know what version of the ReliX you have. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you. Great. No any, any other questions? Any, any other input from anybody? Now's your time. No. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to say thank you so much, Leah, for thank your... Thank you. Um, Excellent presentation, was absolutely fascinating. It's a good summary of everything. Very nice graphics of all that. Um, do you have a um, PDF that you can send us of your presentation? I can, I'm sure I can save that to PDF for you. Thank you so much. And then um, all, the, all the supporting material, that will be very helpful. It was very, yeah, very no helpful problem. to know. Thank you so much and say thank you everybody and we'll hope to see you soon. Our next lectures will be probably in, um, well, we'll actually carry on in August because nobody's going on holiday. So we will, we will um, update you with our next lecture very soon. So thanks, everybody, for participating. Thank we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. much. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thanks. 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 Than